Okay. Okay. So is this working? You're working. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, I want to, on behalf of Mary Kershaw, director of the New Mexico Museum of Art, I'd like to welcome you to the museum and specifically to our historic St. Francis Auditorium. Mary uh, regrets that she's unable to be here this afternoon, but she wanted me to convey the museum's pleasure in being a partner in this afternoon's conversation. A conversation that coincides with the exhibition, Judy Chicago Review, Re Reviewing Power Play at David Richards Gallery. I'm Mary Scully, the Curator of Special Projects here at the New Mexico Museum of Art. And this afternoon, it's my great pleasure to be introducing two distinguished figures in the fields of both art and education. So, Judy Chicago is a feminist, an author, an educator, and an artist. She is perhaps best known for her monumental scaled installation, The Dinner Party. Now permanently installed at the Brooklyn Museum, it is the centerpiece of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Who's sitting in the second row? Elizabeth. <laughs> there goes the incognito. <laughs> While the dinner party is a major accomplishment, to be sure, it is but a small part, a small fraction of what Judy Chicago has contributed through, her, through the decades she has dedicated to her studio practice. Founder of the first feminist art program within a university, her impact has been felt both within the art world and beyond. Through her work, she has expanded the definition of what it means to be a woman, to be an artist, and to be a human being. So. Your introduction's shorter because everybody knows you. That's fine. I'm a um, New Mexican. <laughs> uh, but, um, both a distinguished scholar and curator, Dr. Jonathan Katz is currently the director of visual, the Visual Studies Doctoral Program at SUNY Buffalo and president of the board of directors of the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art in New York City. Most recently, Dr. Katz has garnered national and international attention for the controversy surrounding the exhibition, Hide and Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture, an exhibition he co-curated for the National Portrait Gallery and is now touring the US. A founder of the College Art Association's Queer Caucus for the Arts and Queer Nation, Jonathan Katz is author of the essay, Judy Chicago, Power Play and the Irony of Masculinity, which is included in the Reviewing Power Play exhibition catalog. I can think of no better candidate to sit with Ms. Chicago to discuss Power Play a series of works made in the mid-1980s that examined the construct of masculinity and which anticipated much of the discussion surrounding gender, gender in the decades that followed. Thank you. Shall we start? Yes. We start? So okay. We'll... Sure. Listen, they can't see us. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> now you can see my outfit, right? <laughs> so, if you don't mind, I thought I'd just sort of start by asking you a question, which I always sort of, um, I, I wondered about, which is that, as you know, um, painfully, right, when these works were first shown, they were often misinterpreted, it seems to me, as sort of very clear images about masculinity and maleness in opposition to femaleness. That, that it set up a binary, there was the masculine and the feminine. And, um, and as I've argued in the essay and as we'll obviously talk about, I mean, I think that reading is completely wrongheaded. Did you ever try to correct that reading? Did you ever want to sort of address the meanings behind your work? Well, as you know, Jonathan, when Power Play was first exhibited in New York in 1986, it was the only work I'd, series I'd ever done that was met with complete silence. So there was no real critical discourse. Mm. There was no opportunity to talk about mm. my intentions. It was sort of like I did Power Play. Uh, actually, Power Play is the first series I did in New Mexico. I came to Santa Fe to do Power Play at the uh, home of Mary Ross Taylor, who's also here, who had a house up on Canyon Road. She was running the birth project and through the flower, and she loaned me her house to start working because I wanted to work alone. And after it was shown, it just disappeared. 
And the first person to pay any attention to it was Edward Lucy Smith, who wrote the first monograph about my work. Mm. And it was interesting to me that he was so interested in power play, but he, you know, he looked at it in a um, less full way than you did. And the, I think the main thing, I think your first sentence in the catalog about I, it was lousy timing. I mean, I realized that there wasn't a lot of context for it when I first started doing research and went to the library, you know, and looked up gender, and the only writing there was at that point was on women, yeah. as if only women had gender. Right. So there was a complete, you know, there was a complete uh, historical, philosophical, art critical absence, which has always interested me. Yeah. And so what's happened is that, fortunately, the context has developed behind the art, mm -hmm. you know, gender studies, queer theory. Mm. So I'm just glad I live long enough it's for to, that. For it to catch <laughs> up to right. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. And one of the things that's so striking about this work is the way it anticipates a lot of the developments in what now is called third wave feminism. Because at the time that this work was um, produced, uh, what's often called second wave feminism t tended to be um, much more dominant. And one of the criticisms that third wave feminism made of second wave feminism was the idea that maleness and femaleness were too sort of grossly conceived, too big a categories. And also that the opposition between the two of them was never gonna get anywhere. Because of course, maleness required femaleness to achieve any kind of definition, and femaleness required maleness to achieve any kind of definition. So you were locked, right, in this sort of structure that you needed to get out of. And what, what I love about these works is the way in which, well, in, in some sense, in advance of the critical writing on this, they do that. And we can really see, I mean, I just love the fact that, that for example, um, in the slide that's, that's on, the art, uh, on the audience's right, there are actually three figures, if you look very carefully, right? Um, so you've got the male figure, the woman inside him, and then this putative third figure that occupies the negative space in the legs between, right? And so there's this refusal of binaristic thinking. And I just find that refusal at this moment so apt because I think we're in a moment of great binary thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, the thing I want to say about that is it's interesting because, you know, this is like I was very far away from the academy in the 80s, and that was, of course, when all this anti-essentialism was developing, right? And for those of you who haven't, aren't familiar with that, um, in feminist theory in 19, 1980s, there was an attack on work like the dinner party, uh, accusing it of essentializing women. That is, you know, saying that all women were in a category just based on gender and not looking at the fluidity of gender and the idea that it's like Jonathan just said, it's not that simple. But here I am, you know, in my studio with these images, making images about the interface between the masculine and the feminine and looking at the way in which, in which men often try to kill the feminine aspects of themselves because it's not acceptable. And, and, and also, you know, that was a very false charge about a set that, that my work was essentialist, because, although I do believe there are essential differences between men and women. I mean, women have give birth. That's it, you know? Mm. That's it. And that makes some essential difference. I mean, what are we going to do? Pretend that doesn't <laughs> right, happen? Right, right, right. But the thing is, is, is that you didn't have to be a genius in the 70s to know that the distinction, you know, like, between masculine and feminine and what it means to be a woman, what it mean, means to be a man, you know, are some combination of biology and culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, that didn't seem, I mean, it wasn't like, oh my God, what a thought. Yeah. But what's striking is that, that nonetheless, these works were interpreted as about through, through that lens, yeah, as 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 about men only. That the the nuance, the complexity, the refusal of the binary didn't seem to matter. 
Well, that was a point. I would say we should probably go on with the slides, but I, I would say at that point in time in my career, it didn't really matter what I did. There, people were not going to like it. Because you were just <laughs> too identified with the dinner party, too identified I, with feminism. I, you know, it was like they didn't, they, my content, now I understand it. I didn't understand it at the time. I was still a young artist and, you know, it was really painful. But it was like they didn't like my, they didn't want to deal with the content and so they tried to kill the messenger. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's kind of an old strategy in the art world. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, one of the things that you, you can see again, that even in the single figure drawings, such as the slide that's, at, that's um, on your right, um, the, um, or left, sorry, um, you've got the elbows becoming pendulous breasts. So male and female is, in all of these works, so continuously sort of decentered and complicated as to challenge any kind of simple binaristic reading of gender. Did you want to say something, Mary? Well, go back, Donald, will you? Thanks a second. I just wanted to say something about the drawing maleness because I think there's a, you know, like an, a, an additional way to read that, which is that in a certain way, this person is trapped inside this contained Absolutely. space, right? Yeah. yeah. Forced to be right. something that it has to do with external expectations and may not be what kind of person he yeah. really is, right? Absolutely. And, and talk, if you will, about your decision to separate the words male and ness. The title of maleness is male ness and what that sort of oh, that's does. interesting, Jonathan. Do a reading on it. Well, I mean, at least the way I read it, and you're, of course, the artist, so feel free to disagree, um, is that I, I understood male as a kind of um, flat descriptor. It, it, it is a statement of fact, but the ness part is the social construction of, of masculinity that encloses and demands and constrains the male. Well, that like the ish or the essence, yes. the ness. It's like um, the association. Exactly, exactly. Should we go on? Yeah. And I think one of the things that's um, really interesting about this work, um, the, the the large slide, which is uh, power mad, really uh, did I really, get it right? Really, sa really sad, sad power, power mad, mad. Right. Um, is that you have. Um, again, this sort of play with binary that deconstructs itself um, because, of course, the figures are pretty much engaged in exactly the same posture, but the emotional resonances are totally divided. One says, right, sad, one is mad, one has tears, one has fury, mm -hmm. but the physical expression on the face is identical in both. And um, and I wanted to know. That's interesting. Th I mean, th that has to. I think that has to do with my looking at the limited range of emotion that has been historically allowed to men. Mm. And it, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the process of working on this because when I started. When I, you know, I was classically trained when I went to the Chicago Art Institute, you know, in, in drawing and all that. But when I was growing up, the only model there was practically was the ma female model. And if there was a male model, he always had to have clothes on because God forbid, you know, you would see an erection. Oh my God, you know. So I didn't feel equipped when I first started working on power play I didn't feel as confident about drawing the male body as I was around the female body because I didn't have as much experience. And so I started out by hiring male models. And when I came here, I worked completely by myself. I didn't see anybody here for two years. I just wanted to concentrate on trying to, one, develop facility in drawing the male body, two, becoming confident and three, passing a psychological hurdle, which was that the woman, Paula Harper, the art historian who wrote the first catalog essay on power play in 1986, was an expert in suffrage posters. And she said something in the catalog which was really interesting to me. 
that based on the history of female women's su suffrage posters, women were more comfortable portraying themselves as victims than men as perpetrators. And actually, if you think a lot about the feminist art of the last 30 years, you see a lot of imagery of women as victims, right? And I understood when I started working in the studio with the male body why that might be. Because since women historically have not been the p person in power, we have not had the opportunity to use the male body in the same way the male artists have used the female body. And so, you know, it took me a while, and at first it was very frightening to me. You know, and then I thought about de Kooning's woman paintings, and I thought, ah, oh, he can do it, I can do it, fuck it. You know, but it was definitely a process, you know. Mm. And then also, what is it, that, you know, we, we've seen an array historically of what the female body has been made to express. But there isn't that same historic archive of images of what the male body can be used to express, except homoerotic imagery, right? right? right. But that is a particular point of view. Right. So it was interesting to try and say, OK, so now, you know, what kind of emotions can I convey through the use yes. of the male body? Yeah. What's permissible and what's yeah. not permissible? Yeah. And it, wouldn't it be interesting to explore what's not permissible, like men weeping, yeah. right? right? Or admitting weakness, yeah. or admitting cowardice. Yeah. And that kind of analytical take on, on the male body is so interesting because I have to say that until I encountered this series, the only kind of images of men I saw in contemporary art were either directly homoerotic or flirted with the homoerotic. And, and I want to underscore that this is by both male and female artists, but it was about masculinity as an erotic type right. rather than right a, a more yes. complicated and nuanced understanding of the performance of masculinity. And that's what I found so revelatory in these works. OK, um, let's go on. Wait, can we go back? Oh, I just I'm, wanna, sorry. I just, I'm sorry. I just want to. There's often a, a profile that you use, Judy, which in this disfigured head is, is on the figure's face. And I want to ask you sort of what did, I mean, that configuration, you'll see it again and again. Can you talk about what Well, that I is? think it has to do with looking at the profile and the uh, uh, three-quarter mm -hmm. view simultaneously, right? Mm. Because Donald and I have been watching this uh, we get Netflix series, and we've been watching this series called Lie to Me. And Lie to Me is actually based on a real person who's a detection expert. Who even knew there was such a thing? And it, it seems that there are certain universal expressions. Talk about essentialism. Right, uh, right, right. There are certain universal expressions cross culture. Doesn't matter. Okay. And so um, I think that I, I think I stumbled on it in a certain way in this series, long mm. before I learned about mm. it. Mm. And started you know, using those kind of archetypal mm -hmm. images. And then, of course, what, I mean, I should probably go back a little ways and say that I, I even got interested in power, doing power play when Mary Ross and I went to Italy. And I saw for the first time the great Renaissance paintings, which of course I'd studied in you know, art history in, in school. But I'd never actually seen them. And I, I was struck not only by, you know, how gorgeous they are and how, you know, how they embody some of the highest level of human achievement in art, but, you know, I thought to myself, well, if modern society was born in the Renaissance, so was our concept of the heroic. And mm -hmm. I think interrogating the heroic mm -hmm. was probably the underpinning mm -hmm. of power play, mm -hmm. don't you think? Yeah. I mean, even the fact that the paintings, how many of you have already seen the work? Okay, when you, if you go to David Richards, you'll see, I mean, the paintings are really large. Like one of them, they're, they're like nine feet high and they range from six feet wide to 22 feet wide. And they're done in a kind of modern, uh, analog to traditional Renaissance painting, underpainting, overpainting. But I wanted to use the Belgian linen 
as a field into with which the color could merge. So I developed a special primer where you can actually see the Belgian linen. It isn't obscured by, you know, a layer of white. Yeah. So, uh, but that was my initial, mm. yeah, interest. And 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 you worked. I mean, the many of the images are in very very large scale, and um, and do you, I mean, necessarily acknowledge the the constraints on hanging extremely large paintings. You didn't really care. You just wanted to make a very big. I was, I was a really ambitious young artist. And I wanted to work in the terms and the scale that male artists mm. have enjoyed. Re re regularly worked in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, I'm struck with you saying you were trying to build confidence because of the scale of the works. I mean, that's one of the things I noticed first entering the gallery was just how enormous and how authoritative uh, the pieces were just by virtue of their scale. Yeah, yeah but it was, that, that was, I didn't have any problem with that scale because remember I'd already done the dinner party. It was the, the, the male figure that I was trying to build confidence around. I mean, I had confidence in my ability to work large. I'd already done you know, the dinner party, I'd done all that early work, you know, huge paintings. I'd done, the, I was in the middle of the birth project, which were 85 works, so, you know, one of which at the Albuquerque Museum is 22 feet long. So physical scale I was comfortable with. So, Judy, I wanted to ask you about the, this lavender head. Yeah, um, which is one of my favorite pieces, yeah. actually. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, you, you'll sort of see the great subtlety of color um, graduation in the work. But I wanted to ask specifically about the social and political resonance of the, of, of the use of lavender and, and what you meant right. by it. Well, what do you think? Well, I kind <laughs> of, you know, given my background, um, assume it to be, you know, specifically about questions of sexual difference. But well, I, well, it also has to do with, again, you know, like certain feelings are considered effeminate, right? Yeah. And effeminate men are presumed to, to be, be gay men, right? right? Right, absolutely. So I wanted to talk about those kinds of feelings, the you know, desperate need to be held and the fear of revealing that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and the, the way in which, of course, tears embody, in some sense, both the greatest promise and the greatest threat of masculinity. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, in fact, last night at dinner when I was saying that I started power play with a lot of rage about how men acted and how they treated, had treated me when I was young too. But, but beyond that, I mean, I was not just interested in my own, I was only interested in my own experience as it had resonance in a larger framework. But by the time I finished power play, I had very, very different feelings towards men. You know, I yeah. had developed this incredible compassion. Empathy. Empathy, even. yes, yeah. empathy, I think. On the other hand, you know, men themselves have to make the step to break out. I mean, you know, no matter if, you know, if they want to be trapped. It's, it, anyway, so let me just talk a, a second about how uh, Lavender Doublehead Hold Me was made. It's actually cast paper. It's about four feet by three feet. And that it's that it, I made it. I did it by I did a, an original full scale clay, which was then a mold was made, plaster. I cast plaster, car, did the finished carving in the plaster, then a mold was made, and the paper was actually pulp was actually pressed into the mold, and when it dried, it popped off as a single sheet of paper, and the challenge was. I wanted to um, be able to do the same thing, underpaint with acrylic and overpaint with oil, but you can't paint with oil on paper pulp or it dissolves it. So I had to develop a, a, a clear uh, sealer first. So then I sealed it with sol Solvar and then I sprayed it with acrylic again and then oil painted it. Wow. So, I mean, one yeah. of the things I think about my work is the simplicity kind of belies the complexity of the process. Yeah. But I, that comes right out of California, you know, like, yeah. finish fetish, perfect, <laughs> right? <laughs> Can we see the next one? 
I wanted, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, I wanted you, I mean, I, I. Now this is, this is in the shadow of the handgun. This is nine feet by 12 feet. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's, again, striking about it is the way, again, you can see immediately that the male figure has a, a female breast, that the shadowed elbow becomes a breast, right? So there's constant play back and forth. But I wanted to ask you, and of course, of course, that gesture is one we all know, right? It's the gesture from Michelangelo's great, right, image from the Sistine Chapel, um, except instead of meeting the hand of God, it becomes instead a handgun. But I wanted to ask you whether in the highly expressionist red paint, there was also um, a commentary on abstract expressionism. That's interesting, Jonathan. Well, the, I would say one thing is the fact that there is no um, impasto paint on the surface is definitely a reflection of my discomfort with dominating the surface of the canvas, mm. which, of course, abstract expressionism was all about. And talk about that, because I think that discomfort is really rich. So talk about what you mean by that. Well, when I work, I mean, on whatever I work, on the surface of the work, whether it's glass or acrylic or canvas or fabric, I relate to the surface of the piece like my skin. And so then I want to caress it with my color and my airbrush. And I actually never did before or after did I work in oil paint. I did not like the imposition of the surface of oil paint. It, it didn't fuse, the color didn't fuse with the surface. And so, but I wanted to use oil paint for this, but I wanted it really thin. So it would, you know, not, it would do that, it would fuse with the acrylic underneath it, and they would both fuse with the Belgian linen. So, I, I mean, it's about a discomfort with dominance of any sort, dominance of, yes. Okay. I mean, I, I find it fascinating, but, but, but it, doesn't it get you that the great irony that you are working very hard to elude the dominance over, as Paradigm. it were, the, yeah, over the literal surface of the image, and yet one of the ways that, she, that you are understood is that Judy Chicago is the, you know, the echt feminist who dominates, right? I mean, it's right. kind of... Or you have a public image that's so different than the nuance of the work that I wonder what it's like to live like that. It's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Donald always says that I am in an adversarial relationship with my, what do you call it? My, not my Persona? public, yeah, 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 or my myth, you know, right. But I don't want, I mean, I don't, that, that is not, it's just not real. I mean, anybody who, actually knows me knows it's not real. So where does it come from? Okay, now that's, that's, an, an, interesting that's question. an interesting question, right? I mean, when I was growing up, when I was coming up in LA, you know, there was a, a woman artist named June Wayne who started Tamarin. And um, Nevelson, Louise Nevelson was a friend of hers, so she would come to LA sometimes and work at Tamarin. And, you know, they were like the elder stateswomen, you know, but the way they were talked about in the LA art scene, you know, they were bitches, they were castrators, I mean, they were like these threatening women. And so, I mean, when you are faced with the idea that if you're going to assert yourself as an artist, you're going to be seen through this lens, I mean, that can be pretty intimidating, mm -hmm. you know. So. In order to survive, I mean, one of the things I did was I just removed myself. You know, I worked a away from the mainstream because I just did not want to be, to support that in any way. Yeah. And, you know, it's taken a really long time, but I think finally, you know, right. those scales are falling away, right? Right, right, right. And um, one of the other questions that I've, I've long had about this work is um, that, in some sense, you're often marked as a generation preceding 
the work of those artists of the 1980s that got a great deal of acclaim, like Barbara Kruger. Um, yeah, actually, David uh, Eichholz, after you wrote your essay, and you asked him if he thought I would be upset about it, and David said, why would Judy be upset about it? It's like Barbara Kruger and Cindy Sherman who should be upset. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what, where is David? Isn't that what you said? <laughs> You should explain what you said. All right, so broadly, the argument that I'm making in this essay is that um, much of what in the 1980s um, was widely hailed as sort of leading feminist art turned on irony and the play with irony. And that the thing that was so striking about Judy's work being understood as a, as a sort of earlier generation is that first thing, Judy is pretty much the same generation as those figures, um, six years from, from the birth of Barbara Kruger. But more importantly, that the idea of irony presupposes, I'm arguing, the existence of work like Judy's. Because in order to argue that something, for example, take Cindy Sherman's various poses of femininity, to understand, to even understand that those are citations of, of ideas or ideals of femininity implies that we come to understand these as poses of the feminine. And to understand that they are poses, we have to go here. And so my argument has long been that, that, that this work builds on and builds from your work, but the interesting political point is also that whereas irony allows each of us individually to decode the work, these works instead speak in terms of collectivities. And I'm wondering sort of what it means that we are increasingly unable to imagine a political constituency as a collective and understand politics as purely individual. Oh, oh, you mean uh, feminism, say moi? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. That was an intro. That's been an interesting development in the history of feminist thought, right? Right. Yeah. I, um, I think it's really uh, a salient point that the, the separation between the individual and the collective in, in, the, in needing the irony a kind of post facto, but I think it's, it makes a great point in that maybe we're, this is the best time to look back at this work because we have a value of uh, what happened the decades following and, and see how significant this was in kind of predicting this idea of masculinity and femininity as a stance or something that's performed, not a, not a, not a code or not a given. Well, I, th I think actually Jonathan's point about irony is, is exceedingly interesting because it, would see, it seems to me that somebody could actually, although they never have been clever enough to argue it, Somebody could argue that there is a basic irony at the core of the dinner party. That is, in, instead of looking at it as essentializing women, my intention was that the viewer would take away from it the irony that all these women of achievement who knew, knew nothing about each other, had nothing in common whatsoever, were all forgotten because they had vaginas. Like, right. isn't that ironic? Yeah. Right? right, right. Now, now, how many years is it since I did the dinner party? Right. And not one? Critical. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. No, absolutely. And, and, that's, and that's one of the things that I think makes, I mean, I suppose this is always the case with pioneering works, but there's this idea that it doesn't admit nuance. It is full bore aggressively stating a perspective. And I've always been struck by the fact that that, that has haunted your career. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. OK, so let's move along. OK, this is a 9 foot by 22 foot painting called Rainbow Man. So I, you didn't, I, I just want to yeah, say something please. about this. Now, I think that the basic, um, meaning of Rainbow Man can be understood by almost everybody who has ever been in a human relationship. You're offered the rainbow, right? You're offered connection. You're offered contact. You're offered sometimes an illusion. 
and then you act on it, and you suddenly find yourself de in the position of being pushed away. And if you continue, then there's an acting out of some sort towards you. And I don't think that that's a purely female experience. I think that's a human experience expressed through the male figure. That's what I was talking about, about trying to find my way to what the male, and, and particularly if, you know, we use the um, traditional he or male, then that becomes universal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, male is always universal. Right. Yeah. Right. So Rainbow Man is universal. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have to ask you, because the other aspect of this, and I was actually, frankly, scared to write this, so instead I'm going to say it in public, um, it is, is, the, <laughs> um, uh, is the other resonance of this work, which strikes me as profoundly religious. I mean, these look to me like stained glass windows. Isn't they look to me like church architecture. And, that is really interesting, And there's, Jonathan. you know, the Christ figure proffering and pulling away. And I just wanted, was that ever part the, the of The thing your... that's so interesting about that, Jonathan, is that this is like a long time before I did work in stained glass. Right. And, I mean, I think that is really, really interesting. So, you know how, I mean... A lot of times when you're an artist, you discover that you anticipate yourself before yourself. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, but that's my experience. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like I, I discover that years before I thought I was going to do something, I already suggested I was going to do it. But yeah. that's hindsight. I mean, yeah. that's like art historical perspective. Right. Or, you know. right. No, of course. And even the fact that it's, you know, tripartite makes it religiously resonant. So, yeah. Well, you know, of course, I had looked at, you know, a lot of medieval art in terms of the, uh, as an antecedent for the dinner party, teaching through art, you know. But it is true that one of the great visual experiences of my life was the first time I went to Europe and went to southern France and saw Matisse's chapel, mm -hmm. his stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still, and actually the way the light spills, I just never made the connection. But the way the light spills in the hands mm -hmm. and spills out Absolutely. is very much like Absolutely. the way the color spills onto the white floors, right? Absolutely. That is really brilliant, Jonathan. <laughs> 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 All right, maybe I now shouldn't see, have been so scared. That's what an art, that's what an art historian <laughs> is supposed yeah. to do. We are, after all, um, what, what was it that Barnett Newman said? As, um, as ornithologists are to birds. <laughs> 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 that was his definition of the art historian. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is I don't think the birds can appreciate it as much the artists can if it's done well. <laughs> Listen, I wanted to ask... Um, one general question and then one about the, these works. And the general question is, what did power play, the doing of power play, represent for the subsequent development of your work? Oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, it, it seems now, in, in hindsight, it seems very clear to me that if you look at the dinner party, the birth project, power play, I was looking at power, right? power, lack of power, who has power, how can those who haven't had power attain power, but not power over, empowerment, power. And so it was no particular, and you don't have to be a genius to think, well, that makes a lot of sense in terms of the Holocaust Project, which you know Donald and I did together, because the Holocaust, you could say, is the most grotesque enactment of the relationship between power and powerlessness. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, also, each of these projects took, a, were extended projects. You know, the dinner party took five years, the birth project took five years, uh, power play took four years, the Holocaust project took eight years. And you know, I mean, it's not like I set out, oh, I'm gonna spend five years. It's like, I have a, an idea or an impulse or something I wanna explore and I just follow it. And mm. so it takes as long as it takes. Mm. But Woman 
was one of the last pieces that I did. And it, that actually, Weaving Mailheads, if only they could or would, was one of my favorite drawings from the series. Yeah. And because like I was saying, you know, about what you were talking about, empathy and anguish. And I mean, I, I mean, a lot of my male friends, I noticed that they evidenced a lot of despair about the world, that there was nothing to do about the world, you know, the way it was. And you just had to accommodate it, which of course, made me enraged, because right. like, I'm a red diaper baby, right? And you're like, change it if you don't fucking like it. Right. Right? Right. So, um, but by the time I um, had done the dri driving, I met Donald when I was just finishing uh, Power Play. And Donald said the most interesting thing to me, he said, now, you know, here I am doing this interrogation of masculinity. It tells you something about Donald as a human being, that that didn't scare him away, right? On the contrary, you know, he said something really interesting to me, which was that he was talking about my earlier images of women and how I had made a lot of images, of alternative images for women, of how to empower images, you know. And that he said that men had very few alternative Image, images of how to be a man in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so Donald modeled for a woman, and it, it's a series of bronzes and cast paper pieces. You know, it, it sort of, it's kind of humorous in it, addressing the question what do women really want for a man to be as strong as a man and as vulnerable as a woman. And the, um, you know, I was thinking about raising one's head, making the base of the throat vulnerable, right. opening yourself. Right. And I, I'm uh, very fond of Woe Man. And l let me ask you, because the title Woe Man is, I think, obviously a pun also on woman yeah. and woe right. and man. And well, because it's W-O-E capital M-A-N. Right, right? Yeah. exactly. And I, I wanted to ask whether, I mean, for me at least, um, the neck has curiously labial folds. Oh, my goodness. Um, what are they <laughs> Am I, am I making this up? <laughs> um, um, and so I just wanted to sort of... Oh, the, you know, Jonathan, flesh is flesh, after all. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but I, I'm just sort of wondering whether, uh, from your reaction, perhaps that was not your, your sort of stated intention in this work. I, but think, I think it has to do with flesh is flesh. Mm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting away with it the second time? Yeah, the first time. The second, <laughs> I was going to push you, but yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I do sort of see that. Um, but I also, I, 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 I just, I find remarkable the refusal to allow biology to become destiny in all of these works and the refusal even of biology itself. And, um, and this understanding that we are all flesh, that's the only absolute. Every meaning attached to flesh comes out of culture. That's absolutely right. And Jonathan. everything that comes out of culture is historical and can change. Right. And right. so that's what, for me, so much of this work is about. I think that's really good. I like that very much. <laughs> cool. I, I totally love Jonathan's essay. I mean, <laughs> really, you should read it. It is really incredible. It is just incredible. Okay, so do we have like 10 minutes for yeah, questions? About 15 minutes. Okay, so. Could you stand up, Pat, and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and actually, I think the issue is larger than that. Uh, I think that it is a way to value a second wave feminism, and it's also a way to value the work of Teresa Calder. And in, it was interesting that this was all in the 80s, because I remember getting the little teeny Much happens in the birth. 
was it was work. Uh-huh. Oh, no, Jonathan wasn't arguing that. He was arguing against the way in which it had been, uh, it had been characterized. Exactly. And that, but it sounded Oh, no, no. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to begin. Sure. I, I have to say, I just want to say something about even the uh, disappearance of power play and the resurgence of interest in my early work, thanks to Tim and Lexi and Pacific Standard Time. I, you know, I... People have asked me a lot of times how I managed to survive all the misunderstanding, confusion, all that stuff. I early on put my faith in art history. And actually, it ended up serving me because, yes, my work was misunderstood. Yes, the dinner party had a tremendous struggle finding a permanent home. Yes, power play was lost for a while. Yes, my early work was undervalued, but you know what? That's because of the power of art history, actually, and the fact that ultimately there is a separation that takes place between the bullshit and the real, even though it takes a long time. I was right in putting my faith in art history. That's what I learned as a child, you know, looking at all that art and understanding how, what happened to the Impressionists and what happened to this artist, you know, dying in obscurity and then having their work discovered. Now, that process has not always served women, that's yeah. true, but obviously that's starting to change. Yeah. And I feel glad that I put my faith in the higher ground, yeah. actually. Yeah. And I'm glad that you're around to witness the turnover, rather than as so often happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, somebody else had their hand up. I know I saw somebody in the front. Anybody else? Please, stand up and introduce yourself. I mean, I guess I, I would want to say that, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but I kind of hope that we both, um, you know, both sexes and all the sexes in between both sexes, um, come to understand more and more um, how we've been constructed by our pasts, our collective pasts, and begin to resist that construction, to, to welcome and open ourselves to emotional expressions and possibilities that, you know, I mean, we, we acknowledge this every day in our everyday language. We say to young children, be a boy, be a man, or to a girl, you know, be a woman, be a lady. And that acknowledges the performative, right? right? It's saying right off the bat, your, 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 your genitalia doesn't determine what you do. It's the social role that you inhabit. Yeah, but now women take testosterone when they're going through, cha you know, when they're transitioning. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that both Jonathan and I have been talking about the fact that we don't have to be prisoners of biology, even though we acknowledge the limits of biology. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, we can disagree. <laughs> okay, how about we... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Go outside so you can get Jonathan's catalog essay and read it. Okay, stand up and introduce yourself. No, we have a we have a climate controlled 
temperature control storage facility thanks to Donald, no thanks to me. I was like, I live my life like paint rent store and Donald's like, no, this cannot go on. We have to have a place of our own and we have to have a place for the art. So he gets all the credit for the fact that the work is in pristine condition. <laughs> And I have to say, isn't it also true that one of the, the sort of unacknowledged upsides of being critically ignored is that the stuff hasn't been exhibited, so it hasn't been exposed? <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so due to her neglect, it's in great shape. <laughs> OK, that person, then Elizabeth, and then we'll stop. OK, stand up. Who are you? Interesting. I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I don't know what else to say except that, I mean, I, I you know, I've always tried to find a way to ha have a spiritual dimension to my work because I want my work to transcend the confines of its political and social and historic period. And the only way that's possible is to have, find something in the images that go beyond, right? So I guess that's spiritual. Elizabeth, yeah. Yeah. About, about the distortion of power. Oh, yeah, right. And, and it, 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 it creates um, a disaster on my end. It's wonderful to me that this conversation is really contextualized into where our society has been in relationship to gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like we haven't touched upon it. That's true. David and Richard wanted to show power play, isn't it, David? Do you want to address this? I think you've talked about this quite a lot. Why don't you say something about it? Yeah. 
Well, I would add to what you said, is that, you know, historically men have wielded the primary political and social power. And so I think power play looks at the ways in which they have done that, sometimes with very negative consequences for the planet, for other species, and for themselves, actually, although they're and for themselves. I think the, the, the consequences t for man is one of the things that, you know, being disfigured by power, dis uh, driving the world to destruction, being locked into a position. I mean, we see it all every day in the political process where our politicians, instead of acting on behalf of the citizenry and in service to what would be best for our country, hold on to power above all else. And, and what I find remarkable is that every time you see in that, that manifestation of the face, right, that attempt to control, the other is also and even more powerfully resonating inward as an attempt to control the self. And you can't get past the way those two always are connected. Well, thank you all for coming. What? Sorry. So, uh, copies, copies of the exhibition catalog uh, with Jonathan's essay are available for sale at this table. If you want to line up along the, you know, come along the wall here to pick up your catalogs, and there are um, tickets for the private reception at the gallery later this evening yeah. for sale in the lobby. Yeah, for those of you who don't know this. Uh, after this, Through the Flowers having a small fundraising event catered by Zia, Jonathan and I are going to tour the exhibition and we're going to raffle the boxing ring ad as a small print, if any of you remember my famous boxing ring ad, which kind of commemorated when women came out fighting in the early 70s.